All right, everyone. Thank you for joining me today on the Holistic Hub podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Steph. And today I am joined by Ashok Gupta, the developer behind the Gupta program, which is a wonderful brain and limbic system retraining program that I have actually personally used in my own health journey, but I have had numerous clients use as well. So thank you, Ashok, for joining me today. I'm so excited to interview you. Thank you, Stephanie, for the invitation. Lovely to to be here. Well, I always love to start what gets people involved in developing what they are currently um, putting out there in the world today. So what got you started in developing the Gupta program? What was the passion behind creating this limbic system retraining program? Yes, well, like many of us, it's down to our own experiences, our own challenges, and then going on a journey of self-discovery and then wanting to share those insights with others. So my journey started in the mid-90s when a lot of these conditions weren't really recognised or even given names. And I was studying as an undergrad at Cambridge University and I suddenly got some kind of virus that was medium intensity. I thought nothing of it. And the virus kind of went away, but my symptoms got worse and worse uh, to the point at which I couldn't read the words in a textbook. Uh, I was exhausted all the time. I really couldn't even walk particularly far uh, to the point at which I was housebound, sometimes bedbound, had to crawl to the bathroom. And many people ask me, you know, what is, what is it like when you experience an illness like that? And I describe it like your worst day of flu times five. Right? So it's such a deep draining intensity of exhaustion that you just can't do anything. And I would go from doctor to doctor and they would say, we don't know what you have. We don't know what to call it. We don't have any treatment for it. And you might have it for the rest of your life. Goodbye. And you can imagine for a young man, that was almost like a, a death sentence. You know, it's like, what am I supposed to do with this information? And I'd met hundreds of others who also suffered from the condition. And that started my lifelong quest to try and understand them. And I remember in my worst moments, I was almost suicidal and I used to make a promise with the universe and I'd say if I can just get myself well even if it's 20 percent 30 percent 50 percent maybe 100 percent I will dedicate the rest of my life to helping others with this condition because there is so much untold suffering around the world with people experiencing this what they at that time called chronic fatigue syndrome ME and I then came across some brain neurology by Professor Joseph Ledoux. And I came up with a hypothesis as to what caused these types of conditions. And I managed to get myself in a state where I was brain retraining in a very had ad hoc way. I published my medical thesis and I got myself 100% well and then went on to uh, treat others and set up a clinic. So this was uh, 1999, I published the hypothesis online and then in medical hypothesis in 2002 and then set up a clinic in 2001 to actually treat patients and then we published the Gupta program in 2007 we were the first uh, yeah, to publish in this field and yeah that has been the journey that we've been on and obviously since then we've got an app we've got lots of research studies and RCT so it's been growing and growing since then. Oh my gosh absolutely amazing and I, I know it's incredible to now see how involved the nervous system truly is, the nervous system as well as the brain and brain's involvement in a bunch of different chronic illness conditions. And so I'd love to just dive into how, how does the brain become hypersensitive or in a sense just overreactive in a, in a way to protect us, but producing these different types of symptoms that we experience in chronic illness. And so I'm curious, the limbic system's involvement, and I know within the Gupta program, you talk a lot about the insula and the amygdala, so if we can touch on those as well, and those involvement, yeah, within the um, responses to chronic illness, that would be great. Yes, of course. So it's a, it's a big question. We are, what causes these conditions? You know, the mystery, such a mystery for, for so many of us, isn't it? And so I'd like to start with the first principle, uh, which I use to describe these conditions. What is the biggest question of all? Why are we here? That, that big philosophical question, the meaning of life, why are we here? Now, I'd love to have a, a conversation at a spiritual level with you, but let's put that to one side for the moment. Let's talk about scientifically why are we here? We are here because this brain 
this nervous system, this body, this immune system, has evolved over millions of years to adapt to the environment, learn to survive, so we can pass on our genes to the next generation. So essentially, we are survival machines. That is the, the number one priority of our body and our brain. And an amazing fact that uh, illuminates this point is that we share 40% of the same DNA as a banana, right? Which shows you that we haven't just evolved as human beings, we contain that genetic uh, information right from plant life to invertebrates to reptiles to mammals. We contain that lineage of information. So we are designed to survive. And another clue that we have is that survival the brain cares more about survival than it does your wellness, right? So survival is supremely important. And we are also surrounded by more threats than we ever used to be. So a few hundred years ago, we would live in villages, we'd live in community, and yes, we would have physiological threats, but we also had the support of the tribe and we weren't exposed to so many toxins in our environments. We lived outdoors, etc., etc. right? And now in the modern day world, we're exposed to these threats and those could be food toxins, pollution. These are all threats to the body. Stress, being on our screens too much, smoking, drinking, alcohol. All of these things are threats to the body. And so let me describe how the illness can begin. And we're talking about a range of different illnesses. So it can be neuroimmune illnesses. So that's long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. That can be sorry, fibromyalgia, that can also be sensitivity reactions. So we treat a lot of patients with MCAS and mold illness and electrical sensitivities, mass uh, MCS, so multiple chemical sensitivities, etc. And then there's pain syndromes and then also just inflammatory diseases in general. So how do these illnesses start? Well, let's take an analogy. So Stephanie, are you a fan of fairy tales? And Of course. Who isn't? <laughs> Okay, great. Who isn't? So imagine you are Queen Stephanie of your kingdom. Yeah. So your kingdom represents your body. Yeah. And the castle also is your kingdom. And you are the queen of the kingdom and you have an army and navy. So your army is your nervous system that defends the kingdom. And your navy is your immune system that also defends this kingdom against threats. And imagine that a threat is an invading army that comes over the hill and the army and navy defend that army sorry defend your kingdom fight off the army and your body comes back to balance but now imagine there's a drought in the kingdom so that your kingdom is weaker and often people get these types of conditions when they've had chronic stress or weakness in the run up to the condition not always but but often so imagine now the kingdom is weaker and another invader comes in now, in the case of neuroimmune conditions, this is often a virus or bacterial infection. That's the invader coming over the hill. In the case of uh, sensitivity reactions, that could be food, a toxin, mold, electrical fields, etc. That's a threat. And normally your army and navy can easily fight off this threat, or they may not see it as potentially threatening in the first place. But now they have to really engage. So they fight valiantly to defend the kingdom. But they're not sure if they fought off that invader. So let's take the example of mold. They're not sure if they fought off the mold invader. They think the mold might be hiding in the forest somewhere. So they come to you, Queen Stephanie, and they say, Queen Stephanie, big emergency. We fought off this invader, but we don't know if the invader is still here or not. So we want all the resources of the kingdom. So please send us all the wheat, the corn, the metal, the clean drinking water, the food. All of this should be channeled from the body and given to the army and navy so that we can defend the kingdom, which is why in a lot of these conditions you have often nervous system dysregulation and over triggering and you have immune system dysregulation and often inflammation and over triggering because these two defenders are now hyper defending. And now what happens is even a little man on a horse coming over the hill, which is non threatening, they think, you know what, that might be an invader. Let's trigger off our weapons of war. So they fire off their arrows and missiles, which is the inflammation in the body. So now you have a system where before 100% mold exposure was creating 100% defensive reactions from the army and navy. But now 5% mold exposure can create 100% reactivity 
from the army and navy. So this is where a sensitivity reaction has now been created in the brain as a logical thing to help us survive. And what then happens is, as the army and navy keep hyper-defending, arrows fall back into the kingdom, causing widespread inflammation through the body. And then spies start proliferating in the kingdom. And so you get opportunistic infections, viruses, bacteria flourishing in the body. And this is where you then get dysbiosis in the guts. Because, of course, the more the nervous system is stimulated, the immune system is stimulated, that is dysregulating the gut, causing tightness, diarrhea, IBS, bloating, lack of nutrients, lack of absorption. All these things then causes dysbiosis. And that then contributes even further to the fatigue and the exhaustion and the tiredness. But the main source of the exhaustion is simply that all resources are now being channeled to an army and navy who are hyperfiring. Mm -hmm. And that is why we then feel constantly ill, constantly sensitive to our environment, because the brain is erring on the side of caution. And brain retraining is the next meeting you have with your army and navy generals. You say, my dear generals, I am Queen Stephanie. And I want to thank you for all your great, amazing work. But the war is over. You can stand down. Stop firing off those weapons of war. It's actually not you know, having a negative effect. You can stand down and relax and take some time out. And then the body finally relaxes and go through, through a period of detoxification and a period of parasympathetic rest, heal and digest phase, which it was never able to do normally because it was in this hyper defensive state and that is then in summary the brain retraining that was beautifully said and i love that analogy that was perfect so it to summarize there was potentially chronic stress uh stressors that were was going on in someone's life um, but then there was this initial insult whether it was a mold exposure whether it was um just a really bad SIBO flare-up potentially or just any sort of exposure, toxin exposure that contributed to this rather large insult to the body to where the body was already using some of its resources to help fight off like whatever stress and whatever things somebody was going through, there was an, there was an insult. Then that person's resources, the guards of the gate the, the, of the kingdom were then using up its resources to fight off whatever it is that created this insult to the body. But the problem is, is since a lot of these resources had gotten used up, the body doesn't have enough of them left over. So if there is another encounter, another stress, something else, the body is unable to use its defenses properly to fight off and in a sense has become oversensitized now at this point because it's very sensitive to things in the environment, therefore creating this vicious cycle of creating a lot of sensitivities, chronic illness, creating that gut dysbiosis. And what I'm gathering from a lot of this as well is that it isn't, everything is so connected. It's not like SIBO being just in the gut or mold toxicity being, okay, let's detox the body because everything is connected via the nervous system and via the brain. Is this essentially what I'm gathering from what you were saying? Yes, that's a, that's a good summary. And I think this connectedness is super important because in medicine and even in functional and integrative medicine and the alternative space, we are graduating to this reductionist philosophy that we can boil everything down to the smallest components. Whereas as you rightly say, these are interconnected systems that are all working together and have become dysregulated. And therefore, you can, you know, for instance, you can certainly help detoxify the body from mold. But often patient, patients find that the next time they're stressed out, guess what? The mold reactions come back or the sensitivity reactions come back because the whole system gets dysregulated again. So it's a question of dysregulation of the overall system and its movement towards hyper defensive states uh, so yeah in, in summary the whole system is affected and most of us are going downstream to say right let's try and fix it downstream but what we want to do is go upstream and fix it at its source which we believe is in the brain and if the body is feeling and the brain is feeling that it's still consistently under attack then naturally it's not going to use whatever five percent left of its resources are available to helping the body to naturally detoxify on a regular basis, correct? So that's another thing that you're, kind of the point that you're driving home is that the body is, the brain is still feeling that there is this threat. So it's using up whatever resources are left 
to which which then result in a lot of the symptoms people are experiencing because our bodies are not naturally trying to heal or digest or rest it's trying to fight off what threat it still feels is present correct that's correct and that fighting off response as you say has then secondary effects which is lack of detoxification so our bodies are normally constantly detoxifying but when you're in danger that's not the primary uh, thing that the body wants to do so it leaves that saying well later on when the threat's over then i'll detoxify or then i'll uh you know have that lymphatic drainage from the system or then i will do this then i will do that therefore that exacerbates the whole system and of course once the brain becomes sensitive to one thing it then becomes more sensitive to other things as well so we have patients who get lyme disease initially but then that lyme disease where the body thinks it's under threat from continual lyme then results in mold and then the brain becomes more sensitive to mold and then maybe chemicals and then they get mast cell activation so the system almost is trigger happy to try to find the next thing it needs to defend against and patients also then find that well i'm trying to try these new medications or these new supplements or this new food the body can't handle anything new because it says i'm just trying to deal with what i have right now and then people go on food exclusion diets but the problem there is the more foods they exclude, the more they train their brain that those foods were dangerous, so that it becomes even harder to reintroduce those foods at a later time. So what we're dealing with is a whole system that becomes dysregulated, more and more defensive, and the more that the symptoms are created in the body, the more the brain thinks we're in danger, creating more danger responses. So one of the vicious cycles that keeps us in danger, or keeps the condition going, is the brain stimulates the nervous system and immune system that causes symptoms in the body those symptoms loop back to a hypersensitive brain the brain says we're in danger and round and around we go round the merry-go-round and that's why the body may have this dysregulation for months or years because it's feeding off itself in the dysregulation you mentioned earlier uh, some of the different triggers that you find can be the initial insult to the body that is triggering this hyper responsive state in the brain, contributing to a lot of these different symptoms. So, I mean, in the last like 30, 40 years, we are seeing an, a rise in chemicals that are being used in EMFs and just the way buildings are built with mold toxicity, um, being able to harbor more easily within the home. So um, are those some of the big ones that you typically see as an insult, so electromagnetic fields, um, as well as being mold toxicity, Lyme disease, like what are some of the biggest triggers, I guess, is what I'm asking, um, that can maybe start this vicious cycle? Well, recently we've seen, obviously, COVID and the millions who are suffering from long COVID. So that's been a recent new trigger. And actually that situation has prompted more of the mainstream medicine medical profession to treat these illnesses more seriously because how could it be that you know all these millions can't be making this up or it's not you know it's not in their head these are real physical illnesses so i think covid has been a, a recent one as a trigger i think flus and viruses bacteria those are the kind of things that often trigger this and then obviously mold has been a really big one that we've seen a lot of recently and lyme so it seems that more people are getting lyme more people are getting uh, you know the bacterial infections as a result of the tick bites and that's also causing dysregulation. So I think there's a number of different sources. And then in terms of the background to this, as we've said, because we live in a more biologically, sociologically, psychologically threatening environment, our brains are becoming primed to become hyperdefensive, which is why we're seeing more of these illnesses in society. And there are crossovers with this, because if we look at, for instance, peanut allergies. So I remember 20, 30 years ago, you know, peanut allergies were pretty rare. Now you're finding a big percentage of children are having these allergies and these nut allergies. Mm -hmm. And they also notice that potentially people who are brought up in more uh, polluted environments have more of a preponderance towards sensitivities and allergies and certainly asthma. Because that then gives us the logic that the more threats the brain and the body encounter during childhood, during our teenage years, the more prone it is to learning new sensitivities as we get older. And I think a final piece of the jigsaw here is actually trauma and how trauma links to this. So it's an interesting question where, whether more and more people are experiencing trauma or not. So that's, that's a question I'll leave to the psychologists. But what we certainly do know is that 
our childhood experiences in the womb, so how stressed our mother was, how stressful the, uh, the birth experience was, and especially the first five years of life, pre-verbal and verbal, how we were treated by parents, family, society, massively impacts on our stress levels and our amygdala levels, which we'll come on to. And that can then, those traumas, small traumas, big traumas, can impact on the sensitivity of our brain and how likely it is we then go on to experiencing chronic disease later in life. Okay, so just to clarify then, because uh, we keep talking about the stressors in the environment, obviously things are more stressful n nowadays with just the lack of great work-life balance. There's a lot of stress and just um, just more, more prioritization, it seems, on the grind, quote unquote, versus having that good work-life balance. So I know that can be a big stressor as well. You're talking about childhood uh, growing up, depending on... Um, how you were spoken to as a kid, what the environment was like. So, so there's different factors that can play into this stressful response, which is why I'm gearing towards this next question is why do some people seem to be, or is this why some people seem to be more vulnerable to potentially this limbic system impairment when they get that uh, insult? So whether it was the virus or the bacterial load or it was uh, mold toxicity, whatever it is, is it because it's a matter of what stressors that person had been dealing with prior to getting that because some people might have this mold exposure and can detoxify and be okay while others really struggle with just adding on a binder to be able to support and actually detoxing their body's ability so so i think there are those yes three combination of factors so the first factor is um the stressor itself so the physical stressor then how we felt in the run-up to that stressor and then that third component is our previous experiences in life. So that includes our biological experiences. So how many toxins have we been exposed to? How many, uh, for instance, uh, cleaning products are in our home that have caused that exposure, that toxicity. And then once again, psychologically, how much trauma did we experience in our upbringing, etc., which can prime the pump of our defensive systems. Uh, and then it can also be the pollution the environment around us. So all of these all contribute. So the way to describe it is, let's take you a bucket. Each of us has a bucket. And that bucket represents our ability to handle mental, physical, emotional, biological stress. Yeah. And sometimes it's called the allostatic load, the amount of stress we can handle. And each of us is born with a different bucket, and each of us develops strength and uh, weaknesses in that bucket. Now, really what we want is holes in that bucket, so that when stresses come in and fill that bucket, they also drain away. So the draining away of those stresses are our lifestyle factors. So are we exercising? Are we moving? Are we eating well? Are we detoxifying? Are we de-stressing? Are we meditating? All of these things are a hole in the bucket. But if the bucket gets full of stress, then eventually illness is when the water pours over the edge of the bucket. It no longer is able to handle what is happening in life. So this so many factors it is our childhood it is also genetic factors probably it is also our perception of stress it is coping mechanisms that we have now it's lifestyle factors uh, so all of these things as you can imagine feed into a big formula that then probably determine our chances of one person getting a chronic disease and another person having the same exposure but being completely fine about it and it all comes down to this one thing how much do different parts of our brain decide that something is safe versus something is dangerous? And an example of this, actually, I, I, I give an example, is athlete overtraining syndrome, which is an interesting example of these types of conditions, where somebody uh, may have a virus, and generally athletes have a stronger immune system. We know that overall. They have far lower... You know, uh, chances of cancer and various other diseases because they have a strong immune system because they're exercising. But you also have athletes, those uh, you know, elite athletes who are overtraining. And so their immune system actually goes down. And then there are people who train too hard after a flu or a cold or whatever it may be. And then the system then completely collapses because what's happened there is their brain logically has thought this person hasn't overcome this flu yet but they're pushing their body way too hard. The immune system is compromised. Now we need to trigger those defensive reactions even more. So that gives you an example of when then the brain has made that decision 
that this is the logical thing to do to ensure survival. And the two brain structures we think are involved are the amygdala and the insular part of the brain. So the amygdala, there's two of them. They're two almond-shaped structures that sit behind our eyes. And they decide our emotional reactions to our environment. Now, of course, medicine separates emotion over here, immune system over here, all separate. But the brain makes no difference. The amygdala is not only involved in emotional defensive systems, but also immune systems as well and defensive systems in that type and biological systems. So the amygdala decides what is threatening, what is dangerous. And the insula, which actually isn't part of the limbic system, it sits between our limbic system and cortex. And that part of the brain essentially monitors our internal environment in terms of our immune reactivity, information from the vagus nerve, our nervous system, assesses it, assesses our environment for threats, and then creates an appropriate autonomic immune reaction or response to our environment. And we believe that the amygdala and insula are the two brain structures that get trained to overreact. So probably the amygdala gets overtrained to overstimulate our nervous system, and the insula is where uh, our immune system overreactivity may be occurring. And some very interesting neurology, I'm sure your listeners and yourself would be interested in this. So when they've taken rats and they've given them sweet water, combined with an immunosuppressant, they found that the rat's immune system gets suppressed. Now they repeat that five times, sweet water and immune suppressant. Then they bring the rats back to baseline. Then they give the rats just sweet water. Now guess what happens? The immune systems of the rats actually goes down, even though they have not been given that immunosuppressant. And when they dissect the brains, they find that the two brain structures involved have been the amygdala and the insula. So that is where the core conditioning lies. And there's some recent studies uh, by Dr. Asia Rolls. What they found, their team, was that when they took rats and they put an irritant into the rats that causes inflammatory bowel disease, right? so that's an inflammatory reaction in the gut, they then measured the electrical signature of that in the insula and brought the rats back to baseline so the rats were okay. They then just stimulated that same microelectrical signature inside the insula part of the brain and they managed to cause inflammatory bowel disease in the guts of these rats. And it's the first time, as far as we know, on this planet, we've demonstrated that peripheral immune reactions in the body get stored in a, the insular part of the brain. So that means that it's highly likely that in humans, the amygdala and insula is where this conditioning lies, where this neurological learning lies. And that is at the core of all of these, or many of these inflammatory diseases. Wow, that was absolutely fascinating. So I know everyone's going to find that super interesting as well. Alongside what you were mentioning earlier, so we keep discussing how there is that trigger that sets off a lot of these different symptoms and creates this vicious cycle, but the trigger can then be gone, but these symptoms are still recurring because the brain is still sensing this threat. So curious for those listening somebody who might be listening on the podcast and saying, okay, well, I have been to the doctor. I, uh, they check my labs, everything looks good. And it's told that it's in their head because they're feeling so ill and they have a laundry list of different symptoms, but everything checks out on lab work. So I would say that probably is a really good candidate for somebody to look into doing your Gupta program, uh, and brain retraining, correct? Because these are a lot of those individuals that are suffering from, symptoms that are a result of the brain being so hyper reactive in a response to protect us is that right that's right and i would add an addition to that so those patients mm -hmm. yes it's likely to be in the brain so when the doctor says it's in your head what he's done is say well we can't physiologically test for this so we're going to default to it being psychological which is really unfair because just because we have a gap in knowledge in medicine doesn't mean that then we just assume the patient is making it up Right. This is a very unfair way of treating patients. And actually, we say it's not in the head, but it's in the brain. And treating those two things is very different. But I would also say that even if somebody has distorted lab work, they've got excess of uh, mole toxicity in the body, they've got mycotoxins, they've got um, dysbiosis, etc., SIBO, and these can all be tested for, even then... X does not equal Y. So just because someone has those things does not mean that they are the causal effect. To me, they are the downstream effects of a dysregulated immune system and nervous system, which is causing this. So 
it's even if the labs are coming back complex and whatever, you see a patient automatically assumes, right, my labs have got these deficiencies, these problems, I need to fix each of these at a micro level. The challenge I have to that is that why are we not asking the question, why are they dysregulated in the first place, <laughs> right? Always an integrative medicine, why, 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 why are they dysregulated? What's the reason for that? Is it that the body just randomly goes wrong? Well, it must be some systemic issue where the body's got trained to react or respond in this way, and that's likely to be in the brain. And so we work in complementarity with uh, many integrative functional medicine doctors, mainstream doctors, nutritionists, where they take care of the physiological side in terms of the supplements and medications, and we take care of the, the brain retraining side. And we find that in combination, it's a much more powerful synergy in terms of getting people well. In regard to just developing a whole host of different food sensitivities, sensitivities to all kinds of things in the environment. So I work with a lot of clients with mast cell activation syndrome, and oftentimes triggers can be a multitude of different things for people, or it could be one trigger specific to them, right? So temperature changes are really common, like heat versus cold. Um, foods, really, really common to be super sensitive to a, a wide variety of different types of foods. Um, EMFs is a really another really big one, even just stress. I mean, the, the list kind of goes on for what can be really triggering for that person. And uh, so you, we, you've mentioned mass activation syndrome quite a few times now. And that analogy that you use with the kingdom, I find a, a, a good analogy also probably for the mast cells since they're a big, big part of our immune system and they're a type of white blood cells. So in the cases of chronic illness, mast cell activation syndrome, we often see a very hyperactive immune system that is responding to a lot of different things. And you had mentioned earlier that the immune system's involvement is very key in this as well. And so do you find that the limbic system seems to be a key role in this mast cell activation syndrome condition with a lot of different um, people in terms of, okay, it, do we need to be addressing this limbic system dysfunction to help calm down this immune system response, therefore calming down that mast cell response, and then ultimately then reducing like what people are getting triggered to in the environment? Yes, I take a both and approach, which is let's practically reduce as much as we can our exposures in the environment, but not go crazy. You know, like sometimes people think, right, I've got to go and live in a caravan in Arizona and that's the only way I'm going to stop my exposures. No, we've got to live life, right? Life is here. We've got these gadgets. We've got these foods around us. So the first is in a very calm, practical way. What, how can we naturally reduce our exposures? But then, yes, secondly, it is likely that that conditioning, which is why we are reacting compared to another family member who's not reacting. Like, what's the difference between us? We've got the same, you know, 99.9% .9 of our biology is exactly the same. But there's something in that person's brain or body that is reacting and this person is not reacting. And I believe that is the conditioning, the learning in the brain, the defensive reactions. And many people talk about that being in the limbic system, but actually the limbic system, in terms of that reactivity, is only half the story. And it was really a number of other brain structures, including the insula, the prefrontal cortex, the uh, cerebellum, that are all involved collectively in creating these defensive responses and i think the the limbic retraining is you know one as one part of it but it's an overall brain retraining which is why we don't call ourselves limbic retraining although we do that it's brain retraining as a as a whole neuroplasticity and i think that um this is very exciting period of time for medicine because i think we are going to be able to use this for a whole host of different conditions and already Electro, the idea of electrical medicine, you know, or I can't remember the exact phrase, but using simulation of the vagus nerve to try and, you know, do these things and try and calm the nervous system, the immune system, are also gaining favour. What we're saying is, hey, you can do it naturally. You don't even need to stimulate, which can be uh, haphazard. And also, we don't know the long term effects of mm -hmm. triggering the vagus nerve artificially. I mean, you know, we've all done this in the past where, OK, we've got anxiety. Give people beta blockers and uh, benzos. And that will fix it because that will stop the triggering of the, you know, the brain. But then that caused a whole set of secondary problems, right? So uh, we're always like, how naturally can we get our systems back to balance? 
well, let's get to the root cause, let's get to the wiring of the brain rather than trying to change it further downstream. Yeah, absolutely. That's- and continuing on with mast cell activation syndrome and the sensitivities. Um, so I have had clients that are just absolutely so sensitive to where they're down to just only a few different foods. They're almost feeling as if they can't leave their house because of getting stimulated by whatever pesticide might be getting used on their neighbor's lawn or, um, whatever, you know, EMFs, different things like that. And I find that in those cases, when I have implemented the Gupta program, as well as specific nervous system exercises, that seems to really be a game changer for a lot of people initially um, with their plan, with their treatment plan to start to help them be able to tolerate more things in their environment and to for their body to end up feeling safer. And so I love that you talked on the vagus nerve piece because I know in your program that you recommend it's not just the brain training, but it's also implementing like meditation or vagus nerve exercises or getting some sunlight um, in the morning and different things like that. So I'd love to hear a little bit about some of those extra pieces that you do recommend for people to add in alongside with the brain retraining. Yes, it has to be holistic. Uh, they all have a magnifier effect on each other. So, you know, if you it's no point uh, doing all of this great brain retraining work, but then someone's drinking 15 cups of coffee a day, right? It's going to completely <laughs> offset the good work that someone's doing on their nervous system. So working holistically is supremely uh, important. And therefore, we look at relaxing the nervous system as the starting point, because that prepares your brain to become more neuroplastic. So your brain is not very rewirable when it's stressed, but when it's calmer, it's more open to new ways of looking at things. And therefore, we look at breathing, we look at meditation, we look at um, uh, you know, physical therapies like massage. What is it that you find helps you relax? Yeah? That prepares the ground for brain retraining. And then we also look at the lifestyle effects. So what is a calming anti-inflammatory diet that people can engage in? Once again, we're careful not to stress people out because the moment you say you've got to stick to this diet, people get even more stressed. So we call it the 80% diet. Can you eat like this 70 to 80% of the time, and if you 20% of the time you don't, totally doesn't matter. That's not gonna affect your brain retraining. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, I think the lifestyle factors are really important. So yeah, the importance of sunlight, the importance of uh, pacing yourself, the importance of getting good night's sleep, because a lot of these issues can actually be solved with a really good night's sleep. But the reason we don't get good night's sleep is because when you're in danger or your brain perceives danger, why would it let you have a good night's sleep? Right, so it makes logical sense. So all of these lifestyle factors also fit in with it. And I think a final piece that is really unique and important in our program is we do a lot of something called parts coaching. And what that really means is we want people to get well and stay well. So we help people recognize their stress triggers, whether they are mental, physical, environmental, and learn to calm their nervous system in those situations so that they, for the rest of their lives, whatever they experience, they're able to center and calm the mind and body. We find that's a really important component as well. Oh, yes, I believe that. Absolutely, it is. And circling one more time back to the gut, because I I love that study that you mentioned with the irritable bowel disease and just you keep bringing it back to leaky gut or to gut dysbiosis and things like that. And I would really love to just touch on SIBO for the listeners. Um, I know a lot of people listening struggle with chronic SIBO where they have done multiple, multiple um, treatment rounds and just not getting better no matter how many prokinetics they're going on or diets they're doing to help keep it low FODMAP or whatever it is, right? Um, and I actually had uh, Dr. Allison Seebecker on the podcast recently. Um, for those listening who don't know her, she's nicknamed the Queen of SIBO. She's wonderful and has tons of courses on SIBO. But we discussed a few things that can um, inhibit the migrating motor complex, which is a key integral piece to helping preventing SIBO relapse. And one of the ones we talked about was mold toxicity, which is great because we've been chatting about that. But We also talked about you and your program and also about the nervous system. So when the nervous system is dysregulated, the last thing, again, we've talked about this already, but how the body is not going to focus on digesting properly. It's not going to focus on keeping our gut nice and clean and having that house sweeper of the gut sweeping toxins out into the large intestine to get excreted. So um, I've heard you mention on another podcast how you believe that small intestinal bacteria overgrowth may also be contributed... 
small intestinal bacteria overgrowth may be a result of that dysregulated nervous system and wanting to focus in on that piece too. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on SIBO uh, and gut dysbiosis as well um, with brain retraining. Yes, so I'm sure all of us have heard of the gut-brain axis. And so what happens is we're all trying to figure out the chicken and egg, which one came first. And my humble view, and I'm prepared to be wrong here, but my humble view is it starts in the brain. That when the brain becomes dysregulated because of stress, strains, the natural output of life that we engage with, that then has an impact on the gut. And then the gut feeds that information back to the brain. So the gut assesses our environment, literally our gut feel, as we call it, the gut feel, assesses our environment for threats because, you know, 80% of the the immune system even sits in the gut, it's manufactured in the gut, is assessing our environment and sending messages back to the brain as to how threatening this is, which is why when there's dysbiosis in the gut, that contributes to anxiety and depression in the brain in terms of our subjective experience of life, which can then contribute to more stress coming back to the gut and we can get caught in one of those vicious cycles and what then happens is when the gut is dysregulated as a result of this nervous system dysregulation there are certain foods that the gut is going to naturally be more sensitive to because it's not designed to be in this dysregulated state so therefore of course there are certain food exclusion diets or FODMAP or this that and the other that can help will certainly improve symptoms But Stephanie, I don't know if this is your experience, but certainly my experience time and time again with patients is they can use these physical therapies to certainly improve and heal. And we have nothing against that. But the moment another stressor comes into their life or a challenge or a virus, wham, all the symptoms come back again. And the existing protocols are no longer having as powerful effect. So then they have to either go back on a strict protocol or they have to do this or they have to do that. Because ultimately... What we're doing when we're working at that level is very powerful and positive. It is, but ultimately it's helping the body handle its dysregulated state in terms of the nutrients, the food, the enzymes, the supplements. We're helping the body handle it. And that's why a more complementary approach is to do that. And in addition, look at the brain and the nervous system piece and do that in a complementary way to really, I suppose, live that vision of holistic health. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I thank you. That was great because I believe it too that we need to implement the brain retraining, nervous system work, daily activities that help to just relax the nervous system like you mentioned like going on a nice walk or meditation or getting that natural sunlight. All these things play such a huge role holistically in helping any of these different conditions and again to a lot of Medicine is focused on treating that downstream effect, right? SIBO is such a downstream effect of something else entirely that needs to be addressed as well. So um, I love that we talked about that. I'm so glad we covered it. So in your program, if I may just give an example, you know, a lot of my patients report this or certainly people who don't have a condition, you know, when I'm running a busy clinic and and there's lots of things going on in the Gupta program and all our research, I have to be careful of what I eat, right? So I have to make sure that I wake up, I meditate in the morning, I have good healthy breakfast, I'm maintaining my blood sugar levels, I'm uh, doing all the good things we know uh, that we should do. And that keeps me on the even keel. And, but if I have some fried foods or I don't eat well or whatever, I can, it can start having an effect on me, right? But if I go on holiday and I'm completely relaxed and I don't care and I'm just, you know, not thinking about work, I can eat all kinds of nonsense fried foods, I can not exercise, I can stay up late. And guess what? My gut's absolutely fine. My absorption's absolutely fine. My energy levels are absolutely fine. And yet I'm not doing any of the good lifestyle things I normally would. (laughs) And so it shows us for me, well, for me personally, the critical factor is how centered and calm is your nervous system and your immune system? Are they at standby state? Then your, your resilience and your ability to cope with life is so much higher. But the moment it's in this defensive state, then everything is dysregulated, everything is sensitive, and one little new piece that's introduced to the body suddenly can throw it over the edge. And so that's been my personal anecdotal experience of the gut and how resilient it can be when it's in the right state. 
Okay, that was great because I cannot tell you, I'm so happy you mentioned that because I cannot tell you how many clients that I work with, same thing. So I won't see them for a little bit because they're about to go on vacation. But prior to that, they were experiencing, you know, this, that with their gut symptoms or whatever else it might be. But they go on vacation and they come back and they tell me, I had zero symptoms, absolutely no symptoms. And the first thing that pops into their mind is, oh, well, it must be the food is cleaner. Like, let's just say they went to Italy. And so they have the food, the pasta. It's always Americans going to Italy, isn't it? And then thinking that (laughs) great organic food, you know? Yeah, sorry. Please no, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I went to Italy or wherever and, um, and I ate all the bread, all the pasta, all the desserts and everything. I had no symptoms whatsoever. I didn't take, need to take supplements or digestive enzymes or HCL. And, and so they chalk it up to the food, you know, being, you know, cleaner, which in fact, in some, you know, instances, absolutely it can be. But, um, the first thing I always say is, well, most likely it was your nervous system. You were calm. You were in a calmer state. You didn't have to think about work. You didn't have to think about your chores. You didn't have to think about all kinds of things and you were just relaxing and you were having a, an amazing time. So I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think that is another great way to just, um, just another good way to state it <laughs> that it's amazing that when your nervous system is centered, aside from, you know, doing the things on a daily basis, like the meditation, those things that also center us, but just being in an environment where you're more carefree and not worrying about things, that's also very amazing and supportive to your nervous system too. So that was a great, great thing that you brought up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's uh, anecdotally, we know that patients have up and downs and they have cycles, mm-hmm. right? Now, if you break your leg, you break your leg. Your leg is going to be broken until it heals. It's continuous. Whereas with these conditions, we notice that people have good days and bad days. They have good weeks, bad weeks. And if that's the case, that means the body and the brain do know how to come back to a healthy state and give you energy. It's just that we ride the roller coaster of our stresses, our daily stresses. And one day we may feel emotionally more stressed than another day. and We don't know why. And perhaps we went for a walk. Perhaps the sun was out. So many different factors can then influence our psychology with it influence our gut but the most important thing is this doesn't mean it's psychological no these illnesses are not psychological but what it is saying is that nervous system dysregulation which can come in a myriad of forms does impact on how this condition then plays out and how extreme it becomes and how often we experience it can you talk about the three R's of your program that you mentioned within uh, the Gupta program? I'd love for people to hear a little bit about this. So the first R is, as we said, relaxing the nervous system. That has to be the starting point because the brain is just not rewirable if, if it's busy. So we look at the breathing and meditation for that. And then if people don't like meditation, we've got lots of other tools that people could use to calm everything down. And we do a lot of somatic work as well. So within that, we know that somatic work is very powerful at calming the physical body without uh, working at a cognitive level. So you have those somatic techniques as well, vagus nerve techniques, whatever people want to call them. Then the second R is the retraining of the brain. And that's core and unique to what we do. So we do somatic retraining. We do cognitive retraining. We do all of these different types of retraining, which is like a toolkit. So patients can find the tool that works best for them. And then the final R is re-engaging with joy, which is all about how are we going to stay well for the rest of our lives? How are we going to keep our nervous system calm? And that is about self-love. It's about uh, making sure that we take time out for self-care, that we recognize our stress triggers, and that we actually live a life that has purpose and meaning and isn't defaulting back to our fears. So that's another big piece of it um, as well. And I think there's so many different components in some ways with the Gupta program, because it's so widespread and uh, you know, covers a lot of ground. What we have to tell patients is don't try to do the whole program. Just pick the bits that really help you or resonate with you. And that can be enough to heal. We just made it a very comprehensive program to make sure we cover all bases. So uh, somebody starting to implement the Gupta program, um, into their daily routine, how how much time dedication does it typically take per day for somebody to um, to use the program? We say this is an investment in your health. So the minimum is 30 minutes a day, ideally longer than that, but we recognize people don't always have time. And it's recognizing that even if you're working full time, you can still implement the aspects of the program. 
Something that's made it a lot easier to implement is something called daily Gupta size. And I don't, Stephanie, I don't know if your patients have, have mentioned it, although it sounds like they have, where we have daily Zoom calls with our coaches and that goes through the nervous system regulation and also the brain retraining. And we have two to 300 people a day coming on that. And that has been a game changer because brain retraining works when there is consistency. You know, it's a bit like a yoga class. You go to a yoga class once a week, Sure, that's going to help, but it's not really doing yoga. It's not really getting your body in that state. It is a daily practice that really has the effect on the brain. And therefore, the daily Gupta size has helped motivation, regularity, but also healing and community, knowing that there's two or three hundred people like you on the Zoom call together. And that has accelerated people's healing um, somewhat, quite a lot. And that is something that makes it easier to implement. Because if you're someone who can't, open up a program and follow it and learn the techniques and do it yourself, doesn't matter. Just come on our Zoom calls, we'll hold your hand, we'll take care of you and take you through uh, the exercises. I love it, the different offerings. I think that's really important and very key. So I think that's really great. And yes, I've had clients mention the daily group to size and they love it. So um, yes, thank you for offering that. I think that's really wonderful. And um, another question I had, uh, just because you know a lot of clients that I work with, and I know a lot of people out there that are using the Gupta program are, are because of how sensitive they are to things in their environment, to changes that they can make in their schedules or um, in their treatment plans. So just out of curiosity, since we're, you know, we're diving into that nervous system work, that brain retraining, um, have, is it possible to have like a little mini flare up or have um, symptoms just because we're starting to add in different types of nervous system work like can it can it potentially be too much so in that specific case do you have like your coaches or do you have recommendations in there for maybe starting really really slow so for example like you know getting that little bit of sunlight or doing that little nervous system work that works with you prior to entering into doing more of the brain retraining piece or how would you navigate that yes yeah, so we've actually split our program into four levels now because a lot of people, when they first start the program, they think, the full 15 sessions, I've got to do all of it, otherwise I'm not going to go it well. And we say, no, you have to pace yourself through this. So let's do level one. Let's focus on our nervous system regulation. And only when you feel comfortable with that, then we'll graduate to stage two. And a lot of our patients have really loved that because then it gives them permission to pace themselves as they go through uh, the program. And so I think if someone has a very triggered and stimulated nervous system, the brain retraining can still help, but it may be that they spend more time at level one just mastering that phase and increasing the intensity of that. Because some people may only be able to meditate for or relax for five or ten minutes. That's all they can manage. And then we encourage people, look, just try and make it a minimum of 20 minutes a day. Right? That's when you really hit the sweet spot of calming that sympathetic nervous system in triggering the vagus nerve, you need about 20 minutes because it takes that time just to relax. And once people get used to that, then they can come on to other components. So we definitely recommend pacing through the program and people have to let go of their perfectionist tendencies and their achiever tendencies and the conscientiousness that I need to study this really hard and do it well, because all that does is put extra stress on the nervous system. What you, all you people have done is taken that stress of the nervous system and applied it to the program and now using that as an extra stressor. So time and time again, we have to encourage people to pace through the program and do it in their own space and time. Oh, thank you so much for explaining that. I think that's really wonderful that you have that set in there because I do believe too that a lot of, you know, you know, chronic illness, um, unfortunately, you know, so many people are dealing with all types of chronic symptoms. Um, but I find more often than not, a lot of the clients that I tend to work with are ones that have a bit of that perfectionist mentality. Um, and have kind of always been a little bit in that sympathetic dominant state. So I love that you have that implemented there in the program to especially helping those that do have that perfectionist mentality to to go slow and to not see what you had mentioned I believe is the 15 different modules or sessions and to think okay well I need to get all this done in this next week which can be a lot for somebody's nervous system and to, for their symptoms in general just if they're trying to do too much at once so uh, I think that was a really great point that you brought up mm -hmm. yes it's when the nervous system is so dysregulated it's a habit it's a habit that it's learned and it's learned that that's the correct thing to do. 
So it may just take a little time to unlearn that habit and get it back to baseline. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all this amazing information. I know this is going to help a lot of different people. And I'm just really excited to share this episode with everyone that's listening. So before we end the uh, podcast, I would just like uh, you to mention anything else that if there's anything else that came up that you wanted to make sure that you mentioned for the listeners and viewers and where people can also find you. Yes, of course. So people can find us at our website, which is guptaprogram.com, G-U-P-T-A program.com. Or even simpler, you can just go to App Store or Play Store, type in Gupta Program Brain Retraining, and you'll find the Gupta Program app. You can download it and start retraining your brain for free straight away. So there's lots of free exercises and audios, and you can even join the nervous system regulation part of Daily Gupta Size for free every day, which is our gift back to people. So that's invaluable it's daily sessions you can access access for free and something that i want to mention is that of course the, a lot of people may think well what's the proof behind any of this and for us the science is supremely important so we've actually conducted randomized control studies and clinical audits and have published medical papers on this which i would love for people to also be aware of because then it increases a person's belief in this and you know we've been working on this for 25 years now and so we were the first to kind of come up with all of this and that there are other great programs out there as well. Um, but we feel that there's a certain way that we are kind of more compassionate in our approach and more looking at, you know, the patient's needs. So we published a study on fibromyalgia, a randomized control study. It was published in the journal of clinical medicine. And it found that after just eight weeks on the Gupta program compared to a control group, which was active relaxation, People in the Gupta program had a 40% reduction in fibromyalgia scores, but zero effect in the control group. We halved anxiety, halved depression, halved pain, and had a 50% increase in functional capacity after eight weeks. And those positive effects continued for the six month period. So that's a great study that I'd love for people to have a look at. And recently we published on long COVID, and we found that um, we compared Gupta program to a wellness program, which included diet, supplements, sleep, you know, all the good things we know patients might look at. And we compared them after three months. And in the Gupta program group, the Gupta program was four times more effective at reducing fatigue and exhaustion and twice as effective at increasing levels of energy. Now, it's very rare in medicine you get a 400% result compared to a control group. So this was a great result. People can look up that randomized control trial. And then just this year, we published a clinical audit of our patients. About three or 400 patients were involved in this audit. It was an independent audit. And some of the conditions you mentioned. So after three months on the Gupta program, there was a 67% improvement in mold, 82% improvement in electrical hypersensitivity, 116% improvement in health and functional capacity for people with Lyme disease, 56% uh, improvement in food sensitivities. Uh, so, uh, you know, 84% improvement in long COVID. So you can see that we're getting really great results across 14 different conditions. So it's significantly effective across 14 of those conditions. And that study has just been published uh, as well. So we're building up a base of knowledge so that people don't just feel it's anecdotal, but it's got the science behind it. Wow, that was fascinating. Thank you for sharing all that information. And Thank you so much again for joining the Holistic Hub podcast. It was such a pleasure to interview you, and I'm so excited for people to grab a hold of this episode to learn more about the program. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. It's a pleasure.